Hello, I'm Askar Sharif and you're watching the news from Kazakhstan. Now the headlines. A new confession video appeared on the website Total.kz. This time uh, it features Ruslan Simbinov, the head of the Astana branch of the oppositional party Alga, admitting he is a drug user. Tohtar Aubakirov, the first Kazakhstan's astronaut, left the ranks of the opposition by exiting the National Social Democratic Party. The Foreign Affairs Minister expressed his gratitude to comedian Sasha Baron Cohen for making Borat, which significantly boosted Kazakhstan's tourism. Lukpan Ahmedyarov, a reporter from independent newspaper Uralska Nidele, who was shot and stabbed by attackers last Thursday, is still in intensive care, although his condition is no longer critical. In the meantime, a senior official of the West Kazakhstan Regional Administration, Tlekabul Limashev, doesn't intend to drop his suit against Ahmedyarov for alleged moral damage. The hearing on the civil case went on as planned on Monday, despite the absence of the defendant. The plaintiff seeks to recover over $30,000 from Ahmed Yarov and the newspaper. The reason for filing a complaint by the official was Lukpan Ahmed Yarov's article published in Uralska Nidele on February 2, 2012. In the article, brother, a fiancé and a drag, the journalist exposed keen relations of Yamashev and one of the senior officials from Astana, which boosted his career from an ordinary sports school PE instructor to the head of regional department of internal politics. Yamashev said the article discredits him and his relatives, since it took many years of work for him to take up their current position. On Monday, Pavel Kachatkov, Lukpan Ahmed Yarov and Uralska Nidelia newspaper lawyer requested the court to conduct linguistics and philological examination. The judge satisfied the attorney's motion and scheduled the hearing for April 27. I was hoping the plaintiff to drop the case for ethical reasons. I believe the newspaper also took certain steps in turn. Plaintiff's demands to us are non-specific, they are rather generalized. What exactly does he want? We have confirmed once again both chief editor and myself as a representative of the company that we are ready to enter a dialogue and publish everything the plaintiff disagrees with. Four days ago, the Lukpan Ahmedyarov was brutally assaulted and sustained eight stab and two bullet wounds. His colleagues claim that it's nothing but an attempt to murder the journalist who is known for revealing truth. The extension of politician Vladimir Kozlov's arrest until May 23rd is justified. This decision regarding the previous ruling of the district court was made on Monday by the city court judge. Attorney Alexei Plugov noted that several Kazakh citizens are suspected of inciting social hatred. However, in the case of Alga Party's leader, the defense position was never taken into account, not when it came to arranging visits by the family members, nor during appeals to judges. Plugov believes that getting an overall idea of the evidence collected will be possible only when the investigation is over, supposedly in May. The investigation has been extended until May 6, while the criminal case was instigated on January 6. The detention period has been extended until 23rd. It means that the investigation will end by that time. The case is almost completed and after closing the investigation, we will study all the materials and I believe that court hearings will be held in June or July. A new video confession appeared on the website Total.kz. This time the footage shows a part of the questioning session featuring the leader of the Astana branch of the oppositional party Alga. Ruslan Simbinov, charged with drug possession and dealing, is seen confessing to using mind-altering substances. Injections were made in the groin since it's the least visible area. It was worth noting that the investigation video has been published by Total KZ, the very site that had released on several early occasions seemingly secret information from the interrogation of witnesses allegedly testifying about the prevented terrorist attacks in Almaty. Simbinov's party colleagues are not surprised by the video. They believe the confession alleging that the party branch chief had been taking drugs for 12 years is a logical follow-up to a blunt political provocation that the authorities started against the opposition earlier this year. All these actions are aimed at eliminating the party. That we do not exist legally, as we have been a party under registration for the last 10 years. But to destroy the party physically, that is to eliminate Alga as an entity, this is what is happening, why the property has been arrested and our people were thrown in jail. This is exactly why there are cases of political persecution, blackmail and pressure. The regime is simply rooting out uncooperative opposition from Kazakhstan political arena altogether. 
Jarmakan Tuyakpaya, co-chair of NSDP Azad Party, agrees with this point of view as well. He says that if the authorities are involved in provocation with no shame over breaking moral principles and in the name of the victory of their opponents, it means they have no other arguments in support of their policy's sustainability. They have failed to come up with anything else but to toughen the regime to step up oppression of their opponents, even though they all perfectly understand that it is completely useless. Former presidential candidate Musagali Duambekov believes Ruslan Simbinov's confession video is nothing but a part of a bigger political game. Selling and consuming drugs is not the same, says Duambekov. He notes that in the video the head of the Astana branch of Olga party confessed that he purchased it for his personal use. Meanwhile, Simbinov is charged with possession of especially large amounts of drugs with a further intent of selling them. The public activist believes that this way the authorities want to mar the image of the opposition. I believe it's a politically motivated move. This way they want to accuse the opposition party leader and say that besides politics, he's also a drug dealer. They just want to defame Olga. Ruslan Simbinov was arrested on December 29th of last year. Later, the law enforcement searched uh, the Alga party office, seized all appliances and documents, arrested Simbinov's car and finally searched his apartment. A criminal case was instigated against him on charges of drug possession and dealing, which could keep the opposition member in prison for up to 10 years. The party leader, Vladimir Kozlov, called the actions of the law enforcement a provocation against the political organization, which supported the oil workers in Mangistau. Website Respublika decided to investigate the suspicious resourcefulness of Total.KZ and KTK TV when it comes to publishing supposedly classified information. Apparently, both outlets are owned by the president's family in one way or another. In particular, Nazarbayev's daughter Dariga holds 88% in KTK. The general's director, General Arman Shuraev, used to work for, for the state news agency Khabar, led by Nazarbayev's led uh, the Nazarbayev Selection Headquarters press service in 2005 and at one point was even a member of the president's administration. His predecessor, though, is none other than Ruslan Zhemkov, the current head of the Total.KZ website. When Rahat Aliyev, President Nazarbayev's ex-son-in-law, was still in the country, the channel was headed by Ruslan Zhemkov. Later, he became the CEO of Eurasian Media Forum, an organization created by Dariga Nazarbayeva, president's daughter. Just recently, Ruslan Zhemkov also became the director of the Total.KZ internet portal, the very one that, along with KTK channel, had publicized a sensational revelation. So it's quite possible that in the family clan doesn't legally own the resource, de facto they manage it. Questioning of witnesses in the case of Shed Pemes disorders continued on Monday. Most of them sustained gunshot wounds on December 17 last year. Witness Mazenova said many residents of the settlement entered the streets that day, demanding to stop the violence in Genozien, restore communication and open roads to the town. In response, the law enforcement opened fire. <laughs> The gunfire came from the police. I heard shots fired and it was obvious as regular people didn't have automatic weapons. Let's suppose for a moment that some of them did have guns, but how can you explain that there wasn't a single injured policeman brought to hospital? If police had guns, at least one of the policemen would have been wounded, but none of them was. The guns were used by the police. Janibek Tolegen, the father to Torebek Tolegenov, a disease surgeon, says that the government promised to allocate around $7,000 to families who had lost their close ones, although the families never sold the money. The former head of administration assured that he had actually given the money to the family, although Janibek says that the official didn't even show up to extend his condolences. The head of administration said to village elders that he had personally given the money to the family, although he didn't even show up to extend his condolences. He made me sign a document according to which the money was to be transferred to the charity foundation, but I found out later that the foundation no longer existed. Does that mean you didn't receive $7,000? No, I didn't. But they said the money was given to you. Yes, the former head of the administration said that he personally delivered the money and handed it to me. Not only defendants were subjected to police brutality during the investigation in Zhenozien. Yerlan Khalif, a member of the International Committee Zhenozien 2011, says some of the witnesses were subjected to tortures as well. The activist believes investigators used all possible means to get needed testimonies, which explains why none of the witnesses was able to identify right participants, even indirectly.
One of them said it was a large man with grey hair, while another spoke of a younger man. Supposedly, he was brought to the prosecutor's office where he was beaten and forced to testify against his colleague Melis Sarbaev, who is now on trial and not allowed to leave town. Their argument was that they know for sure Sarbaev looted the ATM, so they needed someone's testimonies about it, although no one really saw it and the witness was with Sarbaev the whole time. He was then subjected to beating taser shocks. Basically, this means that defendants were not the only ones who were beaten, as physical violence was also used against witnesses. The judge began the trial by reprimanding attorney Sansas Bayulu for missing the last hearing as his absence was the reason for postponing the trial. On top of that, Sansas Bayulu was recently detained by traffic police for driving without a license. The attorney refused to comment on the situation but explained that it had to do with the conflict on Thursday when the attorney attempted to talk with his defendants but the security guard prevented him from doing so and even punched the lawyer in the face. Members of the public committee have yet again appealed to the authorities, asking them to suspend the trial over the December 16 tragedy. Activists believe that numerous testimonies about the use of torture indicate the whole case should be sent back for additional investigation. Meanwhile, the speakers noted that ignoring such testimonies makes the eventual verdict questionable. Reporter Ermurad Bapi explained further that courts are not supervised independently by high judicial bodies and there is a lack of specialists in the region who could render free legal advice. With shared efforts of the committee, three volunteers were found, although public activists do not have enough money to send the lawyers to the Mangistau region. The public committee is appealing to businessmen and all those willing to help and provide the funds for covering lawyers' costs. The lawyers are in great demand there because many of them are afraid of speaking up. We should install lawyers monitoring in the Bangistar region. Kazakhstan authorities should immediately suspend the Janozen trial pending a prompt and independent investigation into the defendant's torture allegations, said Human Rights Watch on Monday. The organization's Central Asian researcher Mira Ritman added that anyone responsible for brutality against defendants should be brought to account. The defendants have made grave allegations during the trial of ill treatment and torture that mar the integrity of these legal proceedings. Trial observers in October believe the court should not take into account the defendant's testimonies obtained through the use of violence and threats. Until now, though, the only response from presiding judge is to redirect information about tortures during the pre-trial investigation to the prosecutor's office. All confessions were obtained through torture. These shocking revelations are made for several days during the hearings on December 16th riots. Silence always falls in the courtroom and defendants one by one testified about sadistic methods the policemen used during interrogations. During the questioning, one person was pushing me with a machine gun and another said, just drop her down. I was told it was I who set the youths and alliance back on fire as I had a credit there. Also, I was refused a lawyer. My family members and friends are in this courtroom and that's why I cannot tell everything they did to me. It's just too embarrassing. A guy named Ruslan with a scar across his face was one of my torturers. He put a plastic bag over my head and I was losing conscience. Then they tore a bunch of hair from my head. During the interview, somebody was shouting at me, if you don't like it here in Kazakhstan, go back to your Turkmenistan. I was born there, so they were discriminating me. I was called to the city DIA office to meet with Colonel Kadyrov. He yelled at me and said I will be charged with arson. He hit my head against the wall while my hands were tied behind my back. My underpants were pulled off and he said he will push a jar up my backside. He then hit my back, groin and sides. I cried and told him that my father died and my sister was wounded. I begged him to stop. Even later when I left the hospital I couldn't walk for a long time. More and more fresh evidence of torture during interrogations shocked those in the courtroom and everyone even remotely monitoring the high-profile case. The judge Aral Bainagishpaev made a ruling to direct the materials regarding tortures of the defendants to the prosecution and instructed to provide response within 10 days. These facts must not remain uninvestigated and unpunished, insists Bakhit Dumenova, the president of Aman Sauluk Foundation. She was present at the first few hearings and heard the testimonies of Janozen residents as well as those who quashed the unrest.
Период репрессии, During the Stalinist purges, Prosecutor General Vushinsky came up with the theory that defendants' confessions to the Tsarin of proof confessions were obtained by torture, and we are well aware today about those events. These pages of history are opened now, and we know that people used to confess of espionage for Japan and British intelligence under torture, and they were later executed. They were uncovered at Troika's commissions of three persons who convicted people without trial. I see something similar here. Russell Jumali is one of the analysts who looks into the root causes and the chronology of this important for the country episode. The political analyst says that obtaining confessions under torture is illegal since Kazakhstan joined the anti-torture convention. If the defendants' testimonies will be confirmed, that would mean that policemen did not only abuse the authority but committed serious crimes, which requires an open for public investigation. Kazakhstan signed a number of anti-torture conventions, so the country must follow through with these obligations. If such statements are made, these outrageous incidents require most thorough and transparent investigation. We need to find everyone who was part of it. Meanwhile, the Janosen hearings are still underway. The defense is expecting a response from the prosecution, which may significantly change the course of the trial. European MP Paul Murphy, who was denied a visa to Kazakhstan, has made a new statement in Brussels. While speaking in Parliament, Murphy emphasized the double standards of the European political system. After all, the EU has restricted Schengen entry for several senior officials from Belarus, another country which has political prisoners, while failing to do the same for Kazakhstan's authorities. Thank you, President. Uh, I think actions must now match the fine words of this Parliament if it is not to make a mockery of itself. The report recommends that whenever a gross breach of human rights is committed by a partner country with which there is an international agreement, such as a partnership and cooperation agreement, the EU should take bolder steps, including possible temporary suspension of the agreement. Surely this is the case for Kazakhstan, where 37 oil workers are currently facing show trials for their alleged responsibility in the tragic events in Zhanozen last year where members of the Zen 2011 committee have said that several defendants of that trial have given false testimony under torture and under threats to their family, including Rosa Tulitaeva, who says the police hung her up by her hair and threatened her family, and Tanatar Kaliev, who claims he was beaten while in KNB detention and his son was threatened. Finally, Vadim Karanchin is currently before the court as we speak. He is one of, the courts, one of the country's foremost human rights defenders. He spent more than 10 years in jail already as a result of his courageous defence of prisoners' rights, struggle for social justice. He was arrested on trumped-up charges at the moment that he was going to a press conference to reveal corruption in the, in the general prosecutor's office. He and the others should be released immediately. Thank you. The staff of the Genozen.net website talked about serious DOS attacks against their portal at a press conference on Monday. The latest attack even destroyed the website server. Furthermore, someone is hacking into personal email accounts of the employees, calls their phones with threats, finds every reason to get into the office and damage the journalist's property. To recap, the internet portal Janozen.net was created specifically to cover the Janozen trials and also provide information regarding the disorders and preceding oilman strikes. It should be noted that the other independent mass media sites, including Stan.kz, Guljan.org and Respublika Portal, also experienced downtimes. The car of Salamat Omash was covered in black paint. We also have reports of threat calls. These are the facts. The site has been online for 40 days and we have faced a lot of troubles. We kept silent, but it has been five days and we still can't restore the operation. This is no coincidence. We want to get the message across to our readers that despite rising pressure, we will keep working. Planned exhibitions of the flamboyant Kazakhstan's artist Kanat Ibrahimov might not take place after all, as he found himself a subject to constant surveillance and threats. The anonymous users reacted to the artist's painting depicting the Zhanozen massacre, which Ibrahimov had posted on his Facebook page. There were plans to send the painting to the Russian city of Perm for an exhibition. After posting it online, the artist received a number of threatening messages online via SMS, which some unidentified people even belled his apartment door. According to Ibrahimov, the painting is now in safe location and the audience will see it no matter what. However, the local administration had already threatened the artist about the matter. 
I'm not a rally organizer and I would unlikely participate in the descent rally on April 28th, so I have nothing to do with it. But Dawlet Zulbukharovich revealed his ultimate purpose right there, saying that independently of whether or not I will participate in the rally, I will still be arrested. First Kazakhstan's astronaut Tohtar Aubakirov, the top member of the National Social Democratic Party Azad, has changed his political views and exited, exited the organization. The politician made his statement on Friday night expressing his disappointment with NSDP's policies and praising President Nazarbayev. Social Democrats have lost an astronaut after Dr. Aubakirov left the NSDP Azad. On April 20th, the national hero has made an official statement on Khabar National TV channel. The point of a party is not just to confront the current authorities and president, but to propose solutions to achieve common strategic goals for the good of the nation. The strategy of the Social Democratic Party Azad didn't offer concrete plans on the state's successful development and changing people's lives for the better. This is a reason why I'm leaving the party. I would like to bring my apologies to everyone who joined it following my example. Former fellow members do not criticize Dr. Aubakirov, but at the same time they noticed that such a sudden leave could have been provoked externally. I think in this case the problem is not that our party does not meet his requirements. Sure, the party has many shortcomings which have always existed and always will. We work in a very complex environment and one should look for reasons within the government itself, which in my opinion has staged this walkout. It's noteworthy that this was the first interview to Habar news agency in a while. First Kazakh astronaut has not been giving interviews during parliamentary elections and upon tragic events of December 16 in Mangistau region. He didn't mention those events even during his latest TV appearance. Instead, Aubakirov shared his new views, which contradict previous statements. The nation loves its leader. The preterm presidential and parliamentary elections results confirm this. They both were given a tremendous credit of trust by people who support the cause of the first president and his far-sighted politics. In this relation, I appeal to all Kazakhstan citizens who value the future of our country. I call to refrain from anger and political ambitions and unite around our president Nursultan Nazarbayev. My idea is I am already an accomplished person, my thoughts and ideas, they are completely different, they don't go along with those who suggested lifelong rulings. Unlike social democrats, public activists did criticize the walkout of the national hero. Young politician Mukhtar Taijan immediately recalled a few instances of similar high-profile moves. He emphasized that such decisions are the reasons to reflect on how authority figures in Kazakhstan act when it comes to a serious decision-making. According to a political scientist Dos Kushim, such precedents do not serve in favor of Kazakhstan and its people. Dr. Aubakirov has joined opposition at the merger of the National Social Democratic Party with Azad in 2009. In 2011, his party fellows were planning to nominate the hero of the Soviet Union for Kazakhstan presidential candidate. But later at the party convention of the Social Democrats, it was decided to boycott the elections altogether. Prominent public figure Walihan Kaysarov says Tohtar Aubakirov failed to become a top politician. Kaysarov used to be a member in Azaz and now believes the astronauts' walkout was orchestrated by the authorities. But even if it's not the case, Aubakirov should have known consequences of joining the oppositional party in the first place. The major miscalculation of this decision is that Tokhtar sided with a declining politician. As we all understand, the era of President Nazarbayev is ending, and to anticipate any perspectives of supporting a man who is about to leave the political arena was just politically short-sighted. More changes go to the lawyer's party Adilet. The current party chairman Maksud Narikbayev is replaced by his deputy Toligen Sadikhov. Adilet representatives reported that they held a party members congress in Astana last Sunday, during which Narikbayev had announced his leave. At the same time, the politician is going to remain an honorary member of the party's central council. First time Narikbayev spoke about leaving politics during a similar congress back on March 16th explaining his decision as related to his academic endeavors. He then added that party needs to focus on meeting program goals rather than its leadership. Sapargalis Magulov, the administration head of the Sharbakti district in the Pavlodar region, has resigned voluntarily following his appearance in the infamous incriminating video on YouTube. 
The short video produced by the 57-year-old Cherbakti village resident Mikhail Barsukovsky had appeared on the internet some two months ago. In his 20-minute long film, Barsukovsky wanted to illustrate the insights of living in the province. The video features most prominently the head of the local administration, Sapargalis Magulov, who is accused of corruption and lawlessness. When the video made it to the mainstream media, the official filed a lawsuit against Barsukovsky. But even before litigation started, Smagulov, who served as the village head for six years, rushed to leave his post voluntarily, according to the official statement. It is his personal decision. So on April 19, the head of the regional administration signed an executive order on Sopargalis Magulov's dismissal from office based upon submitted letter of resignation. Yerzhan Kazakhanov, the foreign minister, has thanked British comedian and filmmaker Sasha Baron Cohen for creating the character of Borat and then making a movie about him. Apparently, Kazakhstan's tourism numbers skyrocketed following the release of the film several years ago. The gratitude speech followed after the MP Jampul Akhmatbekov's question asking about what conclusions Foreign Affairs Ministry had made after the series of incidents involving Kazakhstan's state symbols, in particular the incident in Kuwait, when the national anthem of Kazakhstan was replaced by the Borat motion picture soundtrack. The Foreign Affairs Minister said he is not avoiding responsibility for that particular episode, while the ministry employees are now given the strict instructions to avoid the repeat of the situation in the future. For that purpose, all the Kazakh embassies and consulates around the world are provided with packages of national symbols to be used on consistent basis. Ironically, Borat, released in 2006 and directed by Sasha Baron Cohen, actually promoted tourism in the country. A New York-based operator even launched Borat tours to Kazakhstan. This despite Foreign Affairs Minister Mukhtar Karibayev saying previously that Cohen has apparent mental issues, therefore the topic is not worth discussing. I would approach Parat philosophically. After its release, the number of visas issued to enter Kazakhstan had increased tenfold. I would say it's a big victory for us, and I am grateful to Borat for helping to attract tourists to Kazakhstan. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.